Hi, everybody. Again, all of our questions come from hogville.net, so let's get started. Holman24 asks, which receiver do you see as our first to get 1,000 yards receiving? Well, I assume you mean in a season, as many receivers as they have, uh, I don't think they're going to, one of them is going to get 1,000 yards in the season, but if it happens, you know, I'd go with Traylon Burks. Uh, the kid is so fast and so big. I see him getting a lot of yaks, you know, yards after catch. Swinelike wants to know what needs to be done at the high school level for Arkansas to produce the same level of football talent that similarly sized Mississippi and Alabama produce. Hmm. Well, over the last maybe 20 years or so, really Arkansas has turned into more of a basketball state than a football state. I think that's really true in central Arkansas. AAU basketball has got a lot to do with it. Well, what could change it? Mm, every decent-sized city in Arkansas, I suppose, could offer some type of peewee football program, more kids playing at an early age, junior high and high schools making a big deal out of seven-on-seven -seven tournaments. But honestly, it boils down to coaching. Look at all the college players that have come out or out of Warren under Bo Hembry and Kevin Kelly at Pulaski Academy. Arkansas needs more of those type high school coaches. Salmonella says, what would you suggest to improve the game day experience? Don't answer winning, that's too easy. Okay, let's see. I would say, stop using timeouts to trot out big time donors. Timeouts need to be used to fire up the crowd. Downgrade the use of canned music. Let the band play more. Bring out former players to lead the hog call. Let the cheerleaders do their thing. Use the video boards to get fans excited. You don't do that by running ads on the big screens. Fans get enough of that back home watching TV. Okay, Hog Cards wants to know, you mentioned a possible conference move to the Big 12 for the Razorbacks under a certain scenario. Did you base that on the Razorbacks' recent struggles on the field or dwindling attendance numbers? Uh, what factors would prompt the Razorbacks to make such a dramatic move? Would it be, that would, would the SEC even allow it? Well, yeah, the SEC has no way to keep a team in its conference, but if one decided to leave, there would probably be schools lined up wanting to take that school's place. Now, my remarks had to do with recruiting in Texas. You have a better chance of getting your name in front of recruits if you're playing games there. Now, one game a year in Dallas is not enough. Also, it would be easier for Arkansas fans to travel to Big 12 games. Now, if the school ever did leave the SEC, it would be likely as part of some kind of a trade. Let's say West Virginia goes to the SEC, Arkansas takes its place in the Big 12. So will that ever happen? Uh, not likely. Justifiable Hogicide asks, who will be calling plays for the offense this season, Morris or his offensive coordinator? Well, I think Joe Craddock will continue to call the plays, but Chad Morris will be more involved in the discussion and will be more likely to overrule a play that he doesn't like. That's based on what he said so far. Earl Campbell's shot line observes, it seems like the heart, passion, and desire of head coach Houston Nutt's years have not transitioned to more recent teams. Will we play with the heart in the first game or lose? Okay, look, Nutt was a rah-rah guy, but in my opinion, that's not why most of his teams were successful. Nutt had talent. Now, there, has, there hasn't been a, like a D-Mac or a Felix Jones, Peyton Hillis, and certainly a Matt Jones in a long time. And there were a lot of other guys in those years, uh, guys, guys like Clint Sterner, Anthony Lucas, uh, Cedric Cobbs, Marcus Monk. If the current staff turns this program around, it will be because of recruiting. Does that mean playing with heart doesn't matter? No, but if you start with talent, that's where you begin, and then maybe after that you add the rah-rah stuff. And here's another Houston nut question from Hogtide. Just how dysfunctional was the 2006 football team? How do you think Houston nut would have been, uh, do you, how long do you think Houston nut would have been our head coach if he would have put his ego and pride to the side that season instead of out front? Also was Frank grooming him for AD? <laughs> no way Frank Broyles was grooming anybody to be the AD. He was going to stay in that job as long as he could. 
Now, the team was dysfunctional. I had an offensive lineman on that team tell me afterward that the players argue with each other too much. He called it a, a fractured environment. Now, some guys who really liked Nutt as the head coach allegedly harassed others that they thought didn't support Nutt. But honestly, the real problem came from outside the team. There was a plan by certain boosters to bring in Gus Malzahn, eventually make him the head coach, and get Nutt to agree to become the AD. Now, I don't think Frank Royals knew about that plan, and I don't think he would have agreed to it. I think Nutt did know about it, and he wanted no part of it, and that's where the problem began. Nutt worked behind the scenes to discredit those people, but he went after the wrong people, shot at the wrong target, so to speak. Now, it was inevitable that Frank Broyles was going to be forced out as AD at some point. Question is, with all the drama of OC, uh, 06 and 07, would Frank have been allowed to name his own successor, and would the new AD have kept Nutt? Uh, there's just no way to answer that question, but I, say, I would say it's possible, uh, but who knows. Back to the present time, Old Bear says, there's been much discussion of naming the starting quarterback and when it should be done. I would love to hear you list the advantages and any possible disadvantages of waiting until game week to name the starter. You know what, it's, it's really pretty simple. If you have a clear-cut starter, you name him as soon as possible. But you need to be certain that he's the guy. And if you're not sure, then you wait. Now, I don't have an issue with waiting or even playing two guys in the first game if you think each are winners and you still can't decide. What you don't want is a situation like last year where every time you start leaning toward one guy, he changes your mind by making mistakes. And for the record, I don't think that's what's going on this year. Okay, the next question is from Squid Billy, and that's the way he spells that. Mike, when you compare Coach Morris to the other Razorback head coaches that have had reasonable success here, are there similarities between them that make you feel good that he can get it done here? We, know, we all know Arkansas is a somewhat unique job that needs a certain kind of coach to lead us to success. You know what? There are some comparisons, I guess, that could be made to Frank Broyles. Frank was a head coach at Missouri before he came to Arkansas. Missouri, uh, Morris was at SMU. Both had backgrounds in Texas. Frank had been an assistant at Baylor. Morris was a high school coach in many years for Texas and later an assistant at Tulsa and Clemson. Frank recruited Texas heavily and so is Morris. Frank uh, saw the uniqueness of Arkansas and so does Morris. But to me, the difference so far is the staff. Frank surrounded himself with coaches that were on the way up. Many of them went on to become outstanding head coaches themselves. Will that happen to Morris? It's too early to tell. But other than Frank, I really can't think of another head coach at Arkansas that reminds me of Morris. Now, Oklahoma wants to know, which unit are you most worried about being the weak link this year? Come on, this is a no-brainer. I said it last week. It continues to be the offensive line. There is more depth right now there, but it's not a lot of experience depth, and you have to worry about injuries. They lost Noah Gatlin in camp. Colton Jackson continues to have nagging injuries. Look, offensive linemen work in a dangerous environment. They're crammed together in a small uh, space with, with lots of collisions, with the D-line with themselves, big guys falling or stepping on each other. One of your own teammates can injure you. You can get knee injuries, ankle injuries, hand, arm, and shoulder injuries. You know, Ken Hatfield went through two seasons, 88 and 89, with almost no injuries to his starters in the O-line. And he went to back-to-back -back cotton bowls. That's how important it is to keep those guys healthy. But no injuries, that almost never happens. It's really simple. If Arkansas doesn't have a lot of guys over on the bench nursing injuries this year, and if it can avoid the season-ending type injuries, then maybe you'll see some improvement with that unit this season. Okay, we got something new this week. I'm going to ask myself a question. I mean, why not? It's my show. If you were a coach, what is the number one thing you would change from what we see in college football these days? No question, showboating. Taunting and celebration penalties can cost you a game. We saw both Miami and Florida do this Saturday night. Each team was trying to give the game away. It's real simple, control yourself. If you make a big play, let your teammates rally around you and celebrate for you and with you. That gets you out of your opponent's space. 
you don't or one of your teammates don't end up wiping out a game-changing play with a dumb penalty. Okay, another reminder, all of our questions come from hogville.net. If you want your question asked, go there and sign up if you're not currently a member. Then go to the Ask Mike forum and post it. Well, that wraps up another week of Ask Mike. I'll see everybody here again next Monday when I'm sure we'll get a ton of questions about the season opener.